Uh, thank you uh, for coming here to these Drupal API clients. Uh, I'm very excited to be here at Midcamp today, and we'll get moving. We'll get moving. Is the mic working? Oh yeah, the microphone. Wow. Usually I don't need a microphone, but. That definitely makes it clear to people that I'm speaking. Uh, we're, we're a good, real good start, real good start to this uh, session so far. And I've been on a wonderful ride with internet here today, so hopefully that uh, keeps working. But uh, yeah, I am uh, Brian Perry, that's me. I'm a great surfer. Uh, everybody grab a seat. Um, yeah, I live in the suburbs. Uh, I, I drove out here, but did stay at the hotel last night, so I didn't have to have a 90 minute commute this morning. Um, and uh, yeah, I love uh, Drupal and uh, front-end development, decoupled Drupal, relevant to what we'll be talking about today, and uh, also uh, love Nintendo. I got this, this on today. Uh, games I'm playing currently, I am just at the edge of 100%ing uh, Super Mario Wonder. I'm on the final level, uh, and it's really, really hard. Uh, also, non-Nintendo, I am playing Baldur's Gate 3, which is very fun, and this weird, like, poker roguelite game called yeah. Bellatro. Uh, it's amazing. If you have any interest in uh, weird card games, you'll lose most of your life to it, though, so be warned. Uh, I, uh, I work at uh, Chapter 3. I've worked at Chapter 3 for five days. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, not, wow. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'm excited uh, to be working there, continue my uh, decoupled Drupal journey. I think it aligns uh, nicely with some of the things we'll be talking about today, and excited to also get more involved with their uh, Next for Drupal project. And uh, also, uh, I previously worked at Pantheon, and they sponsored uh, time for a lot of the, the work we'll be talking about today, too. So I wanted to thank them, and also I am aware that those companies are related. I'm aware of that. Um, so uh, another side note before we really dive in, uh, just a fun little side project I've been working on. Uh, there, uh, there's a Drupal view transitions module, and uh, these slides are, are actually just a, uh, a Drupal site. These are all Drupal nodes, and it's using the HTML view transitions uh, API for animations. It's fun. So uh, what we're going to be talking about is the uh, Drupal API client project. And uh, what the Drupal API client is, is a set of JavaScript packages to help source data from common Drupal APIs. Um, and the goal, it's definitely not something that is uh, official by any means, but we're going to try to make a pitch for it, is uh, I hope that this can be offered under the Drupal namespace on NPM someday. And we'll, we'll talk more about what that means and why I think it's important. Uh, it also was one of the projects funded by Pitchburg uh, at uh, last DrupalCon. Um, so uh, you shared a video on what we were trying to do and was amazing enough to be uh, voted on to be funded by the community for $10,000. Which then means that uh, this becomes a $10,000 question. Uh, why does Drupal need an API client? So I think there's a handful of reasons why it does. Uh, but one of them, uh, I think, can be told by searching on NPM. So if you search on NPM for Drupal, and I would imagine a front-end developer who maybe uh, was told, hey, you have to work with Drupal now, might do this. Um, the results you get back are kind of confusing. The first result, uh, at least when I took the screenshot, was an implementation of parts of Drupal's user access control API. Uh, there are other things that look like, uh, a, you know, a Drupal SDK four results down, very specific things like an image style generator. And if you uh, know enough to look for uh, an org on NPM, there is a Drupal org for Drupal engineering. Uh, but there are currently just four very specific packages, a couple that are used by core, a couple that support the decoupled menus endpoint. Um, but to somebody new to Drupal, it might not be clear what all these things are. And if you instead search for WordPress, uh, you get results that are more in line with kind of what I would expect. The very first thing is a client for working with WordPress. There's a Gatsby plugin. 
And then there's also a lot of things under the WordPress namespace. Um, I think a lot of that is driven by the Gutenberg editor and the fact that a lot of that is um, written in React and published on NPM. But still, you see a lot of WordPress packages that make a little more sense together in context. And then this is not a perfect one-to-one -one comparison because Contentful is uh, a fully headless CMS. Um, but, you know, think of a developer who's working with uh, Contentful on the back end. Obviously, you have a lot of SDKs and very specific packages for interacting with uh, Contentful that are clearly, you know, namespaced uh, associated with Contentful. So the Drupal story on NPM is confusing. And I think that if it was a little clearer, um, it would definitely be uh, good for Drupal and make it uh, you know, clearer that Drupal is serious about JavaScript. Uh, another reason why I think this needs to exist is people keep making it, <laughs> myself included. Uh, I have a previous project called Drupal State that is, is similar. Um, there is a Drupal JS SDK, a Drupal SDK. Uh, the next for Drupal project has its own client. Uh, there's a project that's been uh, under active development recently called NodeHive, which also created a client around the time we were starting to work on, on this. Um, there's another one called DrupalKit. Um, so for whatever reason, people do keep building uh, these sorts of APIs and SDKs over and over. And they're all pretty similar. You know, the, there's a, a set of base things that they all need to do. So this is an example, little code snippet using uh, Drupal State, the library that I've maintained in the past. And you provide uh, the root of your Drupal instance. You can provide a prefix for uh, your JSON API endpoint. And then you can call uh, await store.getObject and the type of object that you're going to get. In this case, node recipe. Um, and then you get back all of the data from JSON API. Or you can request an individual resource from Drupal if you know the ID. The next for Drupal client looks pretty similar. You create an instance of the client, you provide the root of your Drupal instance, and then it's get resource collection uh, with the resource type. Uh, but there are definitely some differences. Um, so some of these projects serve different needs and priorities. Uh, for example, the next for Drupal client makes some assumptions about React, and it assumes you're going to use it in a React project. It also has assumptions about Next.js. Um, so some are framework specific, some are not. Uh, they've all got different sets of maintainers with different priorities. Um, and there is no, you know, in the way that you can think about Drupal core projects or Drupal core subsystems, there is no official Drupal answer or official Drupal group of people working on this question. Uh, so we all could be wrong <laughs> about this being something that uh, needs to exist, but obviously I, I don't think so. Um, so going back to uh, Pitchberg, um, so this is what we committed to as, as part of that funding. Uh, we wanted to do a uh, what we're calling a vertical slice proof of concept. Um, so a very initial release that it was actually published on NPM that people could start uh, interacting with and give us feedback on. Um, we also are planning on creating a proposal for the Drupal JavaScript maintainers about why this could make sense under the Drupal namespace. Um, and uh, a 1.0 release of a JSON API client that interacts with Drupal's JSON API. And the, specifically the way that we're approaching solving this problem, and, and this was kind of the, the biggest part of how we we're structuring the proof of concept, is that we're trying to design it in such a way that even though the first thing we're shipping is to talk to JSON API, it can support multiple clients in the future. So there's a base class, uh, which we'll take a, a look at. And then uh, any instance for a specific API, like our JSON API client, extends that base class. And the idea is that there's essentially stuff that you need to do to talk to Drupal's APIs, like authenticate and you know potentially cache data. And then things that are going to be specific to the API that you're using, be it JSON API or GraphQL or decoupled router. But having that base class hopefully knocks out a whole bunch of stuff that all of these different solutions need to do one way or the other. So uh, this, we'll just take a quick look at uh, our 
very earliest demo here. <coughs> okay, internet is still working. Um, and we'll just take a, just a quick look here at what this looks like in practice. But so there is the, um, can people see okay? Do we need to maybe do the lights or something? Everybody seems fine or silent. Cool. Uh, so yeah, this is the uh, API client base class and uh, it has a few properties, uh, a base URL and API prefix. And then the one configurable option that we did in this, this demo is a custom fetch method. So um, then uh, the one thing that is implemented by default here is, is fetch. So by default, this uses just regular you know, JavaScript fetch. And then if we look at our JSON API client, um, it extends that API client class and provides a different default for the API prefix because JSON API uses JSON API by default. Um, and then it implements a get collection method, which will uh, construct the endpoint that needs to talk to you on the Drupal side and make a fetch request using either the default JavaScript fetch or the fetch method that you provide and then returns the data. And then if we then take this same base class and extend it to create a GraphQL client, we still have the fetch method and, and all the properties that are available by default. So the thing that we implement for a GraphQL client would be this query method. So uh, similar deal, uh, it's just uh, the way it constructs its uh, API endpoint is a little bit different. And then it um, uses post and provides uh, a body of the request to specify the shape of the object that you want back. So um, the base class is the same, but there's just those two different methods for those different APIs in this case. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what it means to have this extendable base class and, and why I think it's important. All right, yeah, and here's uh, some more things that, that sh this approach should make possible. So uh, you could extend the class to make a GraphQL client like we saw, or um, you could take the JSON API client and extend that to have your own set of opinions. So if you want to use a specific uh, caching mechanism or state management solution, you could do that pretty easily and quickly. Um, maybe you just want to use the authentication methods that the base class provides so you don't have to spend time writing custom code to authenticate with Drupal. Um, or you know, maybe you just want to take uh, the, one of these clients and bundle it in a starter kit of some kind. All that should be possible. So uh, for the vertical slice POC, which uh, we completed uh, a while back now, uh, we just focused it in on getting a collection of resources for a specific resource type. So get, get all your pages, get all your articles, get all your recipes. Um, and you know, we were trying to make it you know, a slice that was pretty deep as far as the configuration options. So we uh, uh, did at least an initial implementation of all of our different configuration options, which we'll go into to detail on. Um, but that gave us enough to publish something that does work for a specific use case. Um, hopefully gave us uh, a good base to work on as far as defining all those options, so we were just kind of expanding on them. Um, but the biggest thing is it gave us a way to get community feedback. People could actually get hands-on, try it out, and let us know uh, where they thought we were going. And uh, since then, we've just kept uh, working on our 1.0 scope, and we're very, very close. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, I'll mention that we'll be at the Contrib Day on Friday. So if you're looking to, uh, to help out, there's some last things we're trying to wrap up. But we've had a, a number of releases. Uh, we're at 0.7.2 so far. Um, but our JSON API client uh, is something that you can install on NPM right now. So uh, I'll go into a few more examples um, as far as what, what we've built so far and what's going to be in our 1.0. Um, and I'm going to do it from our docs, which we've been working on uh, recently. Um, and uh, these are actually, I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, these are actually published on GitLab pages. 
um, and is a, a contains in, interactive examples um, that actually use the client itself. So all the examples that we see here are actually making calls out to a Drupal instance at build time and actually rendering components in the docs, which is pretty cool. So uh, installing it, uh, pretty straightforward uh, if you've used a package like this before. Uh, a couple different ways you can do it. You can use the package manager of choice to install your package. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we supported uh, using a CDN import. Um, so uh, JS Deliver uh, is compatible with what we've built so far. So you can instead just do a script uh, in line and import it as a module if you want to do. And then for uh, what you need on the back end, um, you know, predominantly focused on Drupal core, uh, specifically the JSON API module, and you do enable that. Um, we also did build in support for decoupled router because that's a really common use case. Um, so if you wanted to use the methods that use decoupled router, which we'll talk about, you have to have that installed and enabled as well. So um, let's actually go through, we have a little tutorial here. Um, and that's a good way to show some of the different options that are possible um, with the client. Is that too big? We're going to go with that. Uh, OK, so this very first example, um, Let's, uh, we're going to try to source a list of recipes from Drupal using the Umami, Umami demo data profile. So, um, and the examples in uh, the documentation here, it uses uh, Astro components, which is a, another uh, JavaScript framework. The reason that we're using those uh, in these examples is that it just ends up being uh, pretty framework agnostic, the code examples. So we have JavaScript that is in between these uh, three dashes here, and then markup below that in most, case, uh, most cases is pretty straightforward HTML looking markup. Um, but we uh, create our instance of the JSON API client and pass uh, our base URL. And then here we say await client.getCollection, and our resource type is node recipe. So then we have that uh, recipes object that we get back, and we can iterate over it. And in this case, we just spit out all of the titles for the recipes. So you'll see here, we have a list of recipe titles. Um, you know, not all that complicated, but uh, just a simple example, a few lines of code that allows us to get stuff from Drupal. So um, in this case, uh, Let's see, yeah. All right, so in this example, what we're kind of working towards, so much scrolling here, is, uh, so just the titles, pretty boring, um, but let's say that we instead wanted to get a, a simple grid of uh, recipe cards uh, that are, are displaying in our component here. So, to do that, I think I've skipped over some things in this example, but, um, yeah, here we go. Yeah, I did jump jump past some of it. So we do we made some changes here just in styling to uh, make this a grid, and then uh, we wanted to add a couple of different fields to the card. So we added the uh, difficulty field here, and also we made a link just using the path alias. But the thing that we don't have access to is the image. So if we like take a look at the actual response that we get back from JSON API. We'll see that there's things under attributes and we don't see our image field, but we do see that the field media image under relationships, but the data is just an ID. So if you've used JSON API before, you're probably familiar with this and the concept of relationships, but to get the data for these related entities, we need to adjust the, add some additional parameters to our request to JSON API to get all of that data back. So uh, based on this first example, we don't have images, uh, but the client can also make it easier to get that data back. So that was missing from the context of the example here. So uh, now if we wanted to get the uh, media image field as well, 
there is an options object that we can pass uh, to our get collection request. And we can provide a query string, which is uh, just the query string that you would actually add on to your fetch request to JSON API. So the format here is include equals field media image. However, if we look at the data that we get back there, um, we do have that, uh, but then <laughs> the way things are set up with uh, media in the Umami demo, um, the media image still references something else. So it has its own set of relationships to either a another field media image that is the actual file or a thumbnail in this case. So what we actually want is the thumbnail for this grid so we can adjust our query string to be uh, field media image dot thumbnail. And then if we do that, we will get in the uh, included section of the object uh, all of those uh, results, including the actual files for the thumbnail. And then uh, we also support, um, there's a popular package, uh, JSON API params, uh, which is just a, a little helper to be able to construct uh, those query strings uh, with all of the options that JSON API supports. So you can include filters, sorting, et cetera, et cetera makes it uh, a lot easier. So you could use that library and then there's a get query string method that you can call that just spits out the query string that you would need to pass into the client. So uh, we did all that <laughs> and now we have the thumbnail paths uh, that we can add to our grid. And uh, we just added um, some additional uh, spacing so that the images line up here. Um, but you know, as we saw on this object here, there's the results that we get for each of the individual recipes, but then they reference by IDs things that are included that are in that separate included section. So I'm not even gonna really fully go through all of the details of this snippet of code, but to basically map through those relationships, you need to kind of do a little gymnastics here. You need to for your card, figure out the ID of the media entity, and then that's going to reference the file. So you kind of got to map through there to get the file path that you want at the end of the day. And then at that point, you can use that uh, URL that you got in your image source. And now we see images in our grid. Uh, there's a little uh, note here. So this is a pretty intentionally simple example. If you're using uh, like a meta framework like Astro or Next.js or something like that, you most likely want to use their image component, which can do some additional image processing, handle responsive images and things like that. Um, but trying to keep this kind of simple and framework agnostic. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, we still did have to jump through a whole lot of hoops to be able to kind of follow that path of those entity relationships. Um, the client also does provide some options to simplify that a little bit. So it has an option to provide a uh, serializer. Um, and specifically what we're doing, looking to do here is deserialize the results so it is a, a flatter uh, JavaScript object. Common option among many of these clients. So here's what that actually ends up looking like. So. Uh, JSONA is a, a popular package for this. Uh, there are a handful of other ones. Um, it basically just expects that there is a method serialize and a method deserialize, um, and it can be compatible with this. But we pass in, uh, in the options object under serializer, an instance of this uh, JSONA serializer. And then when we do that, when we make the same request it's automatically going to deserialize the data that we get back. And here's what it ends up looking like. It's a lot flatter. And if we look, for example, for the field media image, where are you? Right here. Um, it actually has everything that we're looking for, like the thumbnail right on that object. And we don't have to go through and traverse all of those things uh, to get at it. So. You know, it's kind of a trade-off, 
Um, but the option exists to use it either way. If you want to interact with JSON API in its core manner, kind of following the spec, you can. If uh, it's easier to work with this data by uh, transforming it, you can do that too. But that lets us just go field media image dot thumbnail dot URI dot URL. So uh, the end result is that we get to throw away that uh, like six lines of code that was uh, jumping through hoops to get all of those relationships. And also, uh, even when we're re referencing our recipes, it's a lot simpler. Recipe.title, recipe.field difficulty. We don't have to go into attributes and relationships and includes, and so on. Uh, so some other things that uh, we can do that are, are handled in this example. Uh, Drupal has a lot of, uh, offers a lot of things around uh, localized and translated content. So that's something that we support as well. And the Umami demo is uh, translated. So you can provide a default locale when you create an instance of the client. So if we provide default locale of ES, it'll add that when making its request to JSON API. And based on just that one line, the end result is that we get all of our recipes in Spanish. And then uh, while you can provide a default, it's also, there's an options object for any of the individual methods that you call if you're getting a, a resource or a collection or anything like that. Um, so you can overwrite it. So even though in this case, uh, the client is created to use Spanish by default, um, you can overwrite it when you make a specific request to get something in English. So obviously that would be handy if you had a language switcher or something like that on your site. Um, let's see, and yeah, we're still building out these uh, docs, uh, but before we jump into some of the other options, just one last thing to show in the docs here. Um, one other thing that we're looking to do is just have a lot of examples with different frameworks. Um, you know, really important, in my opinion anyway, that this be framework agnostic, so that as things fall in and out of favor in the Drupal community, new uh, JavaScript frameworks come along, uh, you should still have this base uh, to work in your framework of choice. So we have just an example here of uh, using it with React. And if you're using just plain, uh, regular client-side React, you have to use React's use effect uh, when you fetch the data. Nothing really special about uh, our library in that case, but this just does provide a, a working example actually running using React uh, in the docs that just shows you, uh, you know, how you could source some data. Uh, so, quickly, uh, some other configuration options that uh, the client offers. We probably won't go into like super huge detail on any of these, but uh, authentication. Uh, that's obviously a big one. Um, so you can work anonymously or you can use, right now we support uh, basic auth, OAuth, and uh, also a cust completely custom authorization header you can provide. Uh, another thing that has come up is uh, cookie uh, authentication in the case of like a um, progressively decoupled use case. Um, and that's something that we uh, have a little bit more work to do to see if that works with what we have today. Um, so basically you provide an authentication option and depending on the method that you're using, like here is just a simple example of basic authentication, you would provide your credentials or in the case of OAuth, you provide a token. Um, and uh, it will manage your authentication and add that to requests. And for something like uh, OAuth, it also handles uh, dealing with the token as well. So it'll get the token initially, check to make sure that it's valid, and if it expires, it will get it for you for future requests. So hopefully that's something that you code that you're just not gonna have to write. Um, also, we use uh, kind of uh, core fetch um, by default but you can provide a uh, alternative fetch compatible method if you have some other fetch library that you wanted to use. Or for example, this, uh, this uh, example right here still uses uh, fetch, but just provides a specific set of headers when any of the fetch requests are made. Uh, something that I've, I've done similar to that in the past is getting information related to Drupal's cache tags so that you can either pass them along on the front end or invalidate routes uh, when things change. And then uh, also we provide a option for local caching. 
so uh, this shows that. Um, so there's a cache option, and uh, your cache method here just needs to have uh, a get method and a set method. Um, so if that's provided, um, and there's a lot of different things that you could use or uh, you know, configure this in a way to be uh, compatible with that. In this example, we're just using a library called node cache. Um, this is meant to run on the server side. Um, but in that case, whenever you make any requests, it will, uh, you know, the first time hit JSON API, but then it will set that in the cache uh, using a hash of the request that you made. And then if you make that request again, it will check the cache first. And uh, if it exists, it'll just return that from the cache rather than having to talk to Drupal again. Uh, and you know, it's optional. There's a lot of cases where um, having things cached uh, might not be what you want. Uh, so you could have it use a cache by default, not use a cache. Um, and also on individual requests, you can override it to uh, force it to bypass the cache. Whoops. And uh, logging, so this is just a simple logging example. Um, there's a, a debug uh, method uh, or option that you can provide that just has additional debug logging. You'll see, you know, it says that we're fetching this particular endpoint. Um, the other thing that it supports is uh, you can provide your own set of logging methods. So uh, we just use console logging equivalents by default, but if you had an actual logging library you wanted to use, you can provide that as well. You know, really trying to focus on all, all these options, so this can be a base that people can hopefully uh, build on. And then also, we support uh, all CRUD operations with JSON API, so you can get your data, but you can also delete things, modify things. Um, you'll obviously need to be authenticated to do that. Um, but here is just a simple example that uh, creates a, a, a new resource um, and just provides uh, an object with the fields that we uh, want to specify when we create our new page. So obviously there's a lot that uh, is possible uh, as a result of that. So uh, a, little more, a little more time here. So that was an overview of what we've built so far um, and we're close to 1.0. We fully expect to have 1.0 out in time for DrupalCon, which is exciting because we can show up and say, yeah, we made the thing. Thank you for that money. <laughs> um, but uh, just a few other odds and ends as we wrap up here. So one other thing that has kind of come up along the way um, when we first pitched this and just early feedback that we got is uh, why not use an off-the-shelf solution for this? Um, for example, there's a lot of things that can talk to JSON API, right? Um, hopefully, what we kind of uh, somewhat painstakingly outlined uh, hopefully makes that obvious, but you know, the idea here is that we really want to be able to easily support some Drupal specific things, whether it's common Drupal authentication methods or um, as this progresses, like if people do uh, adopt this library and use it, there's, I think there's more specific use cases that we can do more to have helpers for, things like um, you know, working with media, for example, or menus, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously, if we picked some sort of off-the-shelf solution, none of that is going to be included within it. Um, and we did look at some of the more fully featured options for this, and it really prevented us from being able to make something that could be extended. So that idea of having like all of those base Drupal things that you need when you talk to an API, um, we wouldn't really be able to have those if we wanted to support another API type. And then also, it allows us to keep our, our dependencies pretty low here. Um, we're not you know, in on a specific library that may or may not be maintained, and so on. Um, also, uh, some things that were kind of fun along the way is some of our developer tooling here and figuring out how to do some of this stuff in a uh, Drupal general project on GitLab. So the project is using TypeScript. Um, we, do, we did come up with a proposal for what uh, our TypeScript coding standard should be, which actually uh, extends and builds on Drupal's coding standards. I know Drupal itself doesn't use TypeScript, but I wonder if there's a need in the community for kind of defining that. Um, we use uh, TypeDoc for our API documentation. If we jump back to our docs here, 
Um, based on code co comments, it generates uh, full API documentation for all of our you know, classes and types and things like that. Uh, what else? We're using uh, PNPM as a package manager, mainly because that is really good uh, working within a mono repo. Uh, we have right now three packages that we publish on NPM and uh, a couple of different examples as well. Um, PNPM handles that really well. Uh, we're using Vitest for testing, ESLint and Prettier. Um, we, are, we also have recently fully automated our publishing uh, on GitLab. So we're using a, a project called Change Sets, change sets to uh, manage like our um, uh, uh, change log and then also publish to NPM. But there is a pretty good uh, open source library for that. So we're doing that through GitLab CI. So if there is a change set and we merge to our main branch, it will automatically publish a release to NPM, which is nice. Um, for our docs, uh, we're using Astro uh, and specifically a starter kit called Starlight. And uh, the cool thing about Astro uh, that we got into a little bit is that Astro works with all kinds of different frameworks. So you could have React components, Svelte components, etc., cetera, uh, in an Astro project. And that makes it really easy for us to actually show real world examples of how you use this library with all the different frameworks. Uh, and those docs are published on GitLab pages, which is nice. Uh, so, uh, going all the way back to Pittsburgh, uh, you might also be wondering uh, about all of the money. Um, things we have done with those funds is we established an, an open collective, we have paid some of our contributors. Um, you know, it's kind of a weird bullet point, but I think it's true, just the Pittsburgh itself, but also having funds and being sponsored uh, increases visibility and also just forces us to be a little bit more buttoned up and serious about this. Um, but also at this point, uh, it also has provided uh, us a cushion for things like maintenance and hosting going forward if we need to have, um, you know, like live Drupal examples that, that people can experiment with uh, that are online. Uh, however, as uh, a, a famous man once said, mo, mo money, mo problems, uh, it certainly hasn't been uh, without uh, its challenges having uh, the, the funds here. Uh, working with Open Collective really personally wasn't quite what I expected. It has made it hard to work with our funds. Um, and Open Collective, it's, it, Open Collective itself is kind of going through some changes as far as um, uh, some of the organizations within Open Collective have closed and exactly how they're managing funds and things like that. Um, and also, just a fun thing uh, for me that you know I kind of knew going into this, but there's also the tax liability of this, and there's just a lot of ways that these funds, um, you know, had to be used for working with Open Collective or taxes that you know we weren't able to just uh, use to fund development on the project. So uh, beyond 1.0, um, so we are going to make the, the pitch, I'm hoping around DrupalCon and uh, hoping I can talk to some people face to face, the pitch about something like this being offered under the Drupal main, namespace. Maybe what it's gonna take is just people actually adopting this and using this in their projects and being able to point to NPM downloads or something like that, but uh, still trying to make that pitch. I think that having a utility like this as kind of an official Drupal thing would be really good for Drupal. There's tons of things that we can still do with our docs. I think we have a, a good start, um, but wanna make sure that we have great documentation. Um, the decoupled Drupal documentation on drupal.org uh, is very incomplete, and you know I can point to myself <laughs> for that, um, but I think the better documentation around these use cases for Drupal in general would be, would be just a good thing. Um, there's a lot of uh, demos and showcase instances and starter kits and things that, that we could build. Um, but probably most importantly, the thing that I would like to do with a 1.0 out in the world is really try to prioritize and focus on community use cases. So what, uh, what are you doing with this that we could make easier? What does a client like this not achieve for you uh, that we could actually spend time on to, again, just knock one other thing off of that checklist that you need to do? Um, when dealing with this data outside of Drupal. 
And then another uh, area that I think uh, is a really interesting area of focus for this project is around types. Um, so we do have a set of types that we um, ship, and you can use this project in uh, vanilla JavaScript or with TypeScript. Um, but a, an area that there's a lot of opportunity, I think, is working with um, JSON schema or OpenAPI to be able to kind of automatically detect uh, the shape of your data within Drupal and then strongly type that when you're dealing with it and automating a lot of that stuff. So that can provide you know, a much easier path to strong typing on these front end projects, really nice developer experience and, and autocomplete based on what you do and don't have in Drupal. And then also that you know there is the fact that we did establish this open collective, and uh, you know potentially there's the opportunity for uh, this collective to focus on other uh, Drupal adjacent JavaScript things in the future. Um, and yeah, the biggest thing is just that I think if uh, you know I think this was important to build, and uh, but if the community adopts it, we we all win. Um, hopefully this will be a useful thing, but. It will continue to get better and better the more that we can specifically address what people actually need to do and use on these projects. Or, you know, if uh, you know, over time something other than JSON API is the thing that the community rallies around, this hopefully gives us a really good starting point to create a client for that. Um, but you know, if uh, it, it isn't adopted, then at least we had some fun along the way. And I do want to thank uh, folks who have contributed. Uh, we have uh, a couple of other uh, maintainers, Kobe and Pratik, um, a handful of people who have contributed along the way, and folks that I also did uh, talk to early on to kind of understand. Most of these are people who have maintained similar projects. Um, so you know, you know, what if there was a kind of Voltron version of this, what would it need to do? Um, and got some great early feedback from folks as well. And uh, if you are interested in getting involved, we are the uh, API client project on Drupal.org. We have an API client channel on Drupal Slack. We have uh, pretty simple uh, Slack meetings every other week, um, really just focusing on kind of what, what we're working on, what we've done, if we've had any releases. Um, pretty low stress, but feel free to drop in on those. Um, and then also, uh, I'll be at uh, Contribution Day on Friday. So we do have a couple of last issues that we're trying to take care of for, for 1.0, but the biggest thing is uh, just any, any feedback uh, we can get from anybody, you know, going through the docs or, you know, what would you use this for, questions you have about it, um, would love to talk about it. And uh, time for Q&A if we have it. Yes? Yeah, so uh, you demonstrated a library for uh, caching, caching requests, right? Yep. Uh, if something changes inside the Drupal, uh, does cache will be a resident back in client also? Yep. The, que the oh. question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. How did you implement that? Difference? Yep. So the question was uh, we have, uh, we support uh, caching, and the question was if something changes on the Drupal side, uh, do we invalidate the cache? So we don't right now, but that's definitely a use case that I think would make sense for us to expand on, and uh, you know another another place where we can uh, improve in the future. So. Yes. Uh, where can we find the documentation that you were going through? I guess. The... Yep, it's linked on the project page, but the URL also is. Uh, project pages .org API client. But the project page probably the easiest way. Yes? Um, about the Drupal NPM namespace, uh, is there any, like, who owns it? Is there any governance? Like, or is this just kind of like a squishy thing that you, you know you're. Yes, the question was uh, about the Drupal uh, NPM namespace. Who owns it? Um, yeah, it's it's pretty squishy, and I think that um, you know proposing this will force us to talk through some of those things that are squishy. So even if the end result is no, this isn't under the Drupal namespace, I think that will still be good for the community. Uh, but the core Drupal JavaScript maintainers are the people who I consider to control that. 
Um, there are four packages that are published under it right now. Two are actually used in core, and the other two were in support of the decoupled menus initiative, uh, which I was involved in, and I went through the process of publishing those. And, and I did work with the, the JavaScript maintainers on that, but it is, uh, the process is not clearly defined. And I think it would be really great for Drupal if it was. Like, is, is there a world maybe where things that are successful in the community could be promoted to that namespace? Does there need to be a separate like Drupal contrib NPM namespace? I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I, I do think it, uh, those are all questions that should be solved. Use this model or this library? Yeah, do, do, does anything use this library right now? I'm not aware of any uh, direct dependencies yet, but I am hoping that that changes. And uh, one thing that I personally am, am hoping to do with it, um, which will use it and also maybe provide some more examples for the community, is I'm hoping to build a, an Astro starter kit that uses it too. I like Astro, it's fun. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry, just at the very beginning, you had a view underscore something you used to make your presentation, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah, the, the presentation itself, um, this actually uses like a, a theme uh, that I created. Um, I can actually just jump over. So, I have considered maybe trying to open source this, but the the view transitions module, that, I think that's the thing that you're thinking of. Uh, the view transitions module itself, I'll actually just go to it. The, uh, the short story with this is, uh, it, so the view transitions API is what does those kind of smooth transitions between pages. Um, and it's a module that when you enable it, it allows those transitions on a Drupal site. There's two modes. One is a, as a single page application. So that actually will convert your Drupal site into a single page application. So maybe that is what you want, maybe that is not. But that's one way to do these transitions. And there also is a multi-page version of these transitions, but it's currently only supported in Chrome. Um, that's actually what I was using in those examples. My hope is that that will be adopted by more browsers and that will just be a thing that this module can use and we can throw away the single page app version even though that was kind of fun to figure out how to do in a contrib module. Um, yeah, and the actual slides itself is a custom theme that, that I built. Cool. Other questions? Yes, I love all these questions, thank you. Yeah, so uh, from my understanding, I'm not uh, super uh, JavaScript at all. So, is it correct to say that I can install the library and it can be used with React and JS? Oh, sorry, and the uh, UJS? Yes, yeah. And yeah, that's definitely something that we, we really focused on with this. It, uh, it doesn't care about the framework that you use. So you can, you could actually use it in a, a Drupal site as well. Yes? Hi, so I, I know Chapter 3 has put a lot of time into like a Drupal Next.js integration. Yes, I'm, I'm um, going to use all of my five days of experience to answer this question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just curious whether, like, they're planning on using this, um, you know, this project in their next Drupal, you know, ecosystem. Yeah. So, um, I mean, uh, obviously, part of what I'm excited about with this role is kind of the potential kind of overlap and, and synergy there. And uh, the Next for Drupal project is, is uh, used uh, a lot within the decoupled Drupal community, so I'm excited to be involved in that. This client definitely could be used in Next for Drupal, uh, but their client also works today, so I'm definitely not going to uh, you know, try to force it to be ripped out if it doesn't need to be, but I would love to uh, be in a world down the line where it makes more sense for a project like Next to, for Drupal to use this client, because it's kind of the Drupal thing, the thing that is being maintained and built in general for the community, and it would actually be more work for Next for Drupal to use their own client. So it could happen, I'd love to see it happen, but I'm not gonna, on my sixth day, force it. <laughs> Any other questions? Man, you guys are, 
are getting an A on questions today. So, yes. Uh, kind of a throwaway question. Do you even, have any, even plan, <laughs> any plans uh, for transitioning off of Open Collective to a different provider? Uh, the question was if I have plans to transition off of Open Collective to a different provider. I do not. Um, I would love to talk about that more if you have experience with that. And um, yeah, in general, uh, yeah, if there was another provider that uh, addressed some of the issues that I experienced with Open Collective, I, I consider it. I wonder if it is just the challenge and weirdness of dealing with money in an open source project that is the real thing that I'm feeling. But cool. Any other questions? I don't want to keep people away from their cafeteria lunch. So <laughs> awesome. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate it.